welcome everybody to today's class. Uh, today is a little different than usual. Uh, so for those students who are new and I'm, I'm in, um, but yeah, if at any time you have a question over anything that I'm saying, uh, feel free to type it in the chat and I will address it. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we're gonna be talking about friction and we've talked about friction in the past. Uh, now we're gonna go ahead and break it down into different scenarios. Uh, the reality of friction is we can't get rid of it and we can't live without it. And while that's a cheesy saying, the truth is you would never be able to walk if we didn't have friction. So uh, friction is part of our everyday life and friction allows us to move. Um, so we can't move or we can't even walk without friction. So let's go and break down what happens in physics and what happens in life and the physics behind it uh, because of friction. Okay, so uh, this is consider what it takes to walk across the floor. In fact, go ahead and take a little walk around, paying close attention to the interaction between your feet and the floor. Uh, now, I know most people are embarrassed and will probably not do this. Uh, however, the better task for this would be as you're seated, uh, take one of your feet, whether whichever one it is, and pretend do the motion of trying to walk. So while you're seated stationary, just do the motion of walking with one leg uh, and do that a couple times and analyze what is happening. As we look at this guy, on some pictures he skipped leg day and some pictures he didn't. So, all right. Um, okay, so by now you should have done that a couple times and we'll get into what is happening here. When I go to the next slide, do not start writing things down and don't start reading it, okay? Like I've said earlier, this will be provided to your teachers to post on their Canvas modules, whatever, and the video of this will also be available. Um, but let me go ahead and explain what happens into it, and then you write down the main gist of it. All right, so first let's just look at the picture. Uh, in the picture, it says that the person is accelerating to the right, moving to the right, and the force of friction is also to the right. And this might seem counterintuitive and to everything that we've taught you so far, because we've always said that friction opposes motion. And that is true, and that's still happening here. Uh, so let's go break down what is happening. When you did the previous activity, and when I asked you to, uh, you know, while you're stationary seated and move your leg, uh, if you noticed your foot was going backwards. So naturally your foot will go backwards and the friction prevents it from continuing to go backwards and it allows you to gain grip and plant your foot, push off and move forward. So while your body is moving forward, the actual uh, action and force here is that you're pushing backwards your foot wants to go back and friction is going forward. So this is why in this scenario, friction seems to be in the same direction as motion, but it's not. Um, your body's motion is different than your foot's motion. Foot is going back and the friction goes in the opposite direction of your foot. The foot is the only thing that makes contact with this road and a plant. Uh, so um, that's what's happening here. So as we look at the highlighted section, it says friction pushes in a direction that prevents your foot from sliding. Again, your foot is going, the circle foot that you see here, it's going backwards and the friction gives you that grip to push off and move forward. If, uh, if you've ever had friction, imagine when you're trying to walk on ice, that would be what it's like, even worse. Uh, you would never get anywhere. But if you've ever walked on ice, then you've noticed that it is very hard and your foot is slipping all over the place. So this is a prime example as of how friction uh, enables us for our day-to-day -day life. So just to make this clear, friction still opposes direction of motion. I know it looks weird in this picture because it says the individual is going to the right. It's the feet that's going back and the friction opposes the direction of the feet, which is forward. So again, that still holds true. Uh, this is nothing that's different. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Um, now, if you have your headphones, or if you want to turn it up a little bit, you're going to have to listen to this. Uh, this is basically a review of what we've covered previously, but we're going to go ahead and um, watch it. How do things move in real life? 
say a ball is moving on a flat ground and there's no external force acting on it. Will the ball eventually come to a halt? Yes, it will. Have you ever wondered why? Say you're skating on an ice rink and your friend is skating on the road. Whose movement do you think will be smoother? Definitely yours. When you hold a bottle in your hand, why doesn't it just slip through and fall? Sometimes when you're walking around in a mall, do you remember seeing a caution sign to warn you about the floor being wet? What explains all this? The answer is friction. The reason why the ball eventually comes to a halt is because of the force of friction. The reason why skating on an ice rink is easier because the force of friction is lesser there. The bottle doesn't slip through because the force of friction between your hand and the bottle doesn't allow it to do so. If the floor is wet, the friction offered by it reduces and there are chances that you might slip and fall. So what is this friction we are talking about? It's quite easy to understand its concept. Friction is nothing but a force. It is the force exerted by a surface where an object moves across it. In the first case, when the ball is moving in this direction, the force of friction is acting in the opposite direction. The force of friction offered by the ice rink floor is lesser than the force of friction offered by the road. Hence, skating on the ice rink is easier and seems effortless. The bottle does not slip down because the surface of your hand offers a friction in the upward direction. And in the case of the floor in the mall, the soapy water reduces the friction offered by the floor. In the coming lessons, we'll learn a lot more about friction. We'll see the fact. All right. So uh, in on-level physics, as most of the problems we've seen, all of our friction has been mainly horizontal because our surfaces have been horizontal. But in real life, it is possible to have vertical surfaces, as you just saw when you hold an object, water bottle, phone, whatever it may be. Uh, so again, it is possible to have vertical friction. It just depends on what the surface is. Uh, again, they're going to be parallel to each other. So friction is always going to be parallel to the surface. But up to this point, uh, we've ignored friction. Or if we've done an example, we've said, oh, just go ahead and include friction. But we didn't really get that deep into it. But the reality is, like I mentioned earlier, we need friction. And we do a lot of different things. Sometimes we spend money and time and research in order to decrease friction. And sometimes we spend a lot of money and time research in order to increase friction. So examples that when we want to go ahead and uh, decrease friction is using sandpaper or motor oil for your engine, for the car, skate surfboard bags, and paint, and so on. You want these to reduce friction. Uh, when you think about the car's engine and you see the RPM, that stands for revolutions per minute. And revolutions are circles. So when you see on your tachometer about a six or seven or eight, whatever it may be, it's going times a thousand. So it's saying it's 6,000 or 8,000 revolutions or circles per minute. If you think about how many that is, it's quite a lot. And it's a lot of activity on that engine and all the different cylinders and aspects of that. So you put an engine oil in order to reduce friction, in order to increase the life and make sure everything runs smoothly. There are often times where you want to have increased friction. So like the little ribs on a plastic bottle, a bath of mats for safety. You know, you don't want to come out and slip. Um, unglazed bottom of a coffee cup, because if you look at your desk or whatever that you may put it, it's always very smooth. You know, the surface of the desk or whatever, what you may have is always smooth. So you want to have something that counteracts it and prevents it from sliding. Uh, and one of the most common examples and what you use and what you already have right now is probably the, your cell phone case. Um, I'm willing to bet that pretty much most people buy their cell phone case with their cell phone almost immediately, uh, simultaneously, sometimes even before. And you do this because to protect your phone but you do this mainly because you don't want it to slip out of your hand because you're holding it vertically most often and you don't want it to just drop down. So these are examples that we do in physics and real life and the physics behind it. All right, so at this time, uh, some of you are already on your phones browsing Snapchat and so on. So, um, but yeah, you're already in your phone anyway. So let's go ahead and do an activity with your phone. Uh, so. Uh, legal disclaimer, I'm not responsible for any damages to your phone, uh, but go ahead and put your phone flat on a desk. Okay, so just take your desk, take your phone, put it flat on a desk. And using the body of one fingernail, 
just make contact with the phone as if you were going to push it forward, but don't push it forward yet. So use the body of your fingernail uh, vertically. Uh, it should be perpendicular to the bottom of it. And gently apply force that it's not causing it to move yet. So you're still applying force, but it's not moving. And then gently, slowly increase that force until it does move. So it should take you, you know, at least two seconds before it starts moving. So I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a few seconds to do that. Again, the key is be extremely slow and apply the tiniest amount of force possible until it eventually starts moving. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the second activity, which still involves your phone. So the second portion, you're doing the same exact thing. Now I'm just going to ask you to take off your case and put it on the surface. Again, I'm not responsible for any damages to your phone. Uh, so take off the case, put it back on the surface, and repeat the process. All right. So now go ahead and put your case back on. You know, don't get too distracted by the notifications that you see on your phone. And um, let's go ahead and get back to the lecture. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, what was the point? We'll come back to this in a bit, and I'll reference these examples in a second. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this problem. Friction opposes motion. We've already said this, and we've seen videos and talked about this plenty of times in pretty much every single class. A projectile launched at an angle at 45 degrees above the horizontal travels through the air. If you remember from our projectiles launched at an angle, uh, we learned that at 45 degrees, you have the greatest range, which is the horizontal distance, and the maximum peak height that you can obtain at midpoint of its flight in the air, uh, so when it's in motion. So max height happens at midpoint, and the greatest range, obviously, is the horizontal distance occurs when you have a 45-degree angle. So a projectile is launched at an angle of 45 degrees above the horizontal and travels through the air. Compared to the projectile's theoretical path with no air friction, the actual trajectory of the projectile with air friction is what? So we're comparing two scenarios. The first scenario is the fact that it's the theoretical one, the one we've always taught you, that there is no air friction, and if you launch it at 45 degrees, you get the maximum height at midpoint, and you get the longest range. However, that's theoretical. In real life, you will experience air friction. And in that scenario, how does that compare to the theoretical one? So the correct answer for this is, well, since friction opposes motion, the max height is lower than what the original one, it still happens at midpoint, but it's not gonna go as high. And the range is shorter. It's not gonna travel horizontally as great as it did in as supposedly uh, the capillated version as it should without any motion uh, friction. So, um, again, friction opposes motion even when it's in the air. Now, some of you may have been looking at this and saying air friction, we've never referred to this. Well, the reality is air resistance is indeed a type of friction. Uh, the, so, air resistance is also referred to as drag. So, in our FBDs, force body diagrams, you may have seen F air or FD for F drag, and they both represent air resistance and they're interchangeable and air resistance falls under the category of friction. However, uh, generally speaking, when we refer to friction moving forward, we are gonna be referring to when two surfaces, two hard surfaces make contact with each other. But just to illustrate the example, we refer to this as air friction here. So again, air resistance, FD or F drag, uh, they are both the same thing and interchangeable. All right, friction opposes motion. So if the box is pushed towards the right across the classroom floor, the force of friction in the box is directed towards what? Well, if it opposes motion, the box is moving to the right, then obviously the friction is to the left. Now, the green arrow that you see at the bottom is not an FBD. This is just to indicate that the object is moving to the right. 
if we were to draw the right uh, the force applied on an FBD, we would draw it from the right side of the box. Even though you're pushing from the left, remember that force body diagrams represents or the vectors represents the direction in which it's acting. So the force from the left is acting towards the right. That vector for force applied would be to the right side of the box and the frictional force would be to the left. Okay, so let's look at this picture. Is this car moving? Well, it doesn't look like it. And as we analyze the three kids, surprisingly enough, the smallest kid in the middle is the one who's got the best technique. Uh, the one in the red shirt is just like the kid who basically writes his name on a group project and expects to pass along. Um, but as we look at it, we can tell that the car is probably not moving. It's not realistic for these three kids to be pushing, especially with the one in the red shirt, uh, in order to uh, get this car moving. But let's pretend this was you and somebody else, your friends, and you push and push and you finally feel the car start to move. Suddenly you'll notice that once it's moving, it's a lot easier to move in order to keep it moving. And you need less force, uh, less effort. We'll explain how this happens. All right, so now uh, I've referred to this previously in my, some of my previous classes. There's two, type, there's two main types of friction. Uh, there's a static friction, which we designate with the subscript of FFS, uh, force friction static. And there's also kinetic friction, and we have subscripts of FK for that. So kinetic friction is force FK. Static friction acts on an object that isn't sliding. So an object is stopped and you apply on it and it's not moving. That's when you experience static friction. Kinetic friction is a frictional force that opposes motion of an object, which it is sliding or moving another surface along another surface. So when you think about it, most of our examples, when you've seen friction, it was already moving. So it was experiencing kinetic friction. Uh, if you ever remember the FPD example of a car on a ramp that is parked, or if you just think about any kind of car on a hill or an angle, an incline, decline, whatever it may be, and it's parked, uh, it's, you know, naturally once it's rolled down, friction opposes it in the opposite direction. It's experiencing static friction at that moment. So um, the sled is a great example, but one of the better examples that I want you guys to remember regarding this is the plane pool. So um, now, as it says, write everything down on this slide. This is the official uh definitions and so on that we may use and you may see come across in quizzes and tests and so on. So static friction is the amount of force needed to overcome in order to start or set an object in motion. So it starts with an or static, the first letter is S and keep that in mind that it's for the starting or setting an object in motion. Kinetic friction is the amount of force needed to overcome in order to keep an object in motion. So kinetic starts with the letter K and kind of remember that for keeping an object in motion. Another example is if you remember Xbox, they had the camera for motion sensor and it was called the Xbox Connect uh, because it captured motion. So they were just playing off of that. Um, now this statement is always true. Static force friction, F of FS, is always greater than static uh, kinetic force friction, FFK. So put a star next to that, highlight it if you have to. But static force friction is always greater than kinetic force friction. As a result, more force is required to start motion than it is to keep it in motion. Now, as we see in this picture, we see a strong man pulling the plane and there's tons of, tons of different forces being uh, over here. Obviously there's force applied, there's force tension with the ropes, one in front of him, two in the back. Uh, so we'd have to have two different force tensions in that case for the one in his back, one in front. Um, there's frictional force and so on. But as you notice, and I'm gonna touch on this right now, but we're gonna get into this at a later lesson. He is pulling this plane and he's not just pulling it horizontally. If you look at the ropes and as that, he's pulling at an angle. And uh, it's always easier to pull than it is to push. And we'll get into this another day, but just think about if he was behind this plane, there was no way he could move this. 
there's no amount of push that he could do in order to get this going. However, when he's pulling, he's going to have an easier time to do this. And we'll get to the nitty gritty and the science behind this as of what's happening. But just keep that in mind that pulling an angle is always easier than pushing. And a prime example of this is when you think about tow trucks. You know, no tow truck will be pushing a car, towing a car from the front of it. They always tow from the back of it. And traditionally, they lift it up at an angle and lift it. So we'll get into that at a later time. All right, so remember our phone activity from earlier? The static friction was basically the amount of friction it needed in order to overcome and start set the object in motion. So when you applied force and it didn't move, you didn't apply enough force applied, you didn't push it hard enough in order to overcome the static force friction. That's why I asked you to do it slowly. So the force applied that you were applying at some point was not enough to match and overcome static force friction. At some point, it did overcome. It became equal to it, and it overcame it, and that's when it started to move. And if you notice, it went all of a sudden from a small movement to suddenly jumping an inch or two, depending on how much it was. You weren't expecting it to go that far. Once that happened and it was in motion, you experienced kinetic friction, which caused it to move easier because kinetic friction is less than static friction. And if we go back to the example of the plane pool by the strongman, and we'll see a video on this, is originally it's much harder for them to get it moving. However, once it's moving and they pick up some speed, they're actually pulling a lot easier. But the reality is happening is the fact that he's getting weaker and weaker by every second, and he's unable to apply as much force. But its advantage to that is he doesn't need to apply as much force as he was. So while burning up energy, he's getting weaker and he's applying less force, he continues to move it and go faster because kinetic friction is now different than static friction and you are able to overcome that much easier. All right, so let's go ahead and see the strongman pull uh, demonstrated and I'll break this down. So Eddie Hall next to take on the Hercules with the plate pull. And he's tied first in the last two events. Spectacular comeback from last place to fourth. Well, Danny, we saw Paul and Tuck in the heats and he won that. But you really do need all four limbs working properly. And with two fingers dislocated, I can't imagine he'd get a really good pull with that left arm. But he's doing very well. He's got this up to speed. It's also just worth pointing out again, this is a man, a human man, pulling a plane. And it doesn't matter that he's crossed the line, the plane has to cross the line. The main wheel there must cross the line. He's stumbled. 24.39 meters, he's got just under 60 centimeters to go. But he's dropped the rope, he's dropped his mouthpiece, that's it. Oh, he's all right. Well, 24. Point four five meters. He's in the lead. Herculean effort there by Eddie Hall. The two big boys still to come. Just lost his way at the end. Might have finished that if he hadn't staggered. All right. So let's just break this down. Uh, I don't know if you caught on to it, but the announcer uh, said that he had two dislocated fingers. I know people who get a sprained finger and they can't do any work. Uh, so this guy is pulling a plane. But um, but yeah, but let's look at him starting off. As you notice with the rope on his back and so on, and even find they're all at an angle and he's pulling at an angle. So it's not horizontal, it's pulling at an angle. Again, that makes it a lot easier uh, going forward. And when he starts, it takes him a while because he's trying to overcome that static force friction. So Eddie Hall next to take on the Hercules with the plane pull. And he's tied first in the last two events. Spectacular. So at that point, he eventually came, overcame static force friction. And now that he's moving, it's getting transitioned into kinetic force friction. And since it's much lower, you're going to see him pick up speed. Keep in mind, the strongest that he was, if we were able to see his strength and the bar or something, it would be before he started pulling. 
So as every second goes by, he does get weaker and he's unable to apply as much force. But the kinetic friction is a lot less and he doesn't need to apply as much force. Last place to fourth. Well, Danny, we saw Paul and Tuck in the heats and he won that. But you really do need all four limbs working properly. And with two fingers dislocated, can't imagine he'd get a really good pull with that left arm. But he's doing very well. He's got this up to speed. It's also just worth pointing out again, this is a man, a human man, pulling a plane. And it doesn't matter that he's crossed the line, the plane has to cross the line. The main wheel there must cross the line. He's stumbled. 24.39 meters, he's got just under 60 centimeters. To okay, so he stumbles, he staggers, loses velocity, and changes direction a little bit, and eventually comes to a stop. And he may or may not know the physics behind it, but he realizes what is happening and that he basically is unable to get, be able to go ahead and get that started again. Because once it stopped, he's going to experience that static force friction again. And unlike before when he started, uh, he doesn't have as much energy as he did. So he's aware that he's not going to be able to overcome that static force friction to get this movement again. So that's why he pauses. All right, so now we move on to our actual equation for this uh, scenario. And you may have seen it across because we've, de we've dealt with equation 7 and equation 9. And you may have wondered why we skipped equation 8 when we would ask you for force friction. And equation 8 is used for friction. So this is equation 8 in your formula chart. Uh, it's the force of friction, F of F, and any force is always in newtons. Then you see that weird symbol. It looks like a U. It's actually a Greek letter called mu. And that is the coefficient of friction. The coefficient of friction always has a value between 0 and 1. Uh, 0 and 1 are the extreme cases. Pretty much 99.999% of the on-level physics problems that you will see, your answer will always be a decimal. So put a star next to that, highlight it, and use that as a test-taking strategy. That if you see an answer choice for the coefficient of friction that is negative, or happens to be greater than one, then that is the wrong answer. That is not possible. Uh, so it should always be a decimal between zero and one. It also will never have any units. So there's actually no units for the coefficient of friction. It's just the decimal. So put that in big capital letters and um, highlight it as you have to. So it's the coefficient of friction times our normal force, our Fn. So force of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction times our normal force. And remember that normal force is a force exerted by a surface in order to maintain its integrity and support the weight of an object. So uh, we say that normal force is the weight. And imagine yourself right now sitting on a chair. You have a certain weight that you know, gravity obviously is pushing you down. The chair is exerting a force back on top to move in, you know, in an upwards direction, and that is your Fn. So it matches your weight, it matches that force in order to support your weight. So F normal, in this case, is our weight. And remember that from previous uh, problems, equation number nine, it says weight Fn or Fg is equal to Mg because Fg and Fn are equal to each other most of most times, at, you know, pretty much uh, for most of the problems you will see. But there are exceptions where Fn is not equal to Fg. So here's those examples. Uh, normal force, remember, is perpendicular to the surface. In physics, the word normal means perpendicular. So when we say normal force, it literally means the perpendicular force to the surface. It is usually the same as an object's weight. However, there are two situations when it's not. Those two examples are when you have an object on a ramp in an inclined plane, as well as sometimes when something is pulling up or pushing down an object, even though it's on a flat surface. Okay, so first scenario is if an object is on an incline, kind of like that, how that arrow is, if you could imagine that being the surface and you have an object on there, the Fn would be, you know, different. It would be the Fn would be perpendicular to the surface. So it wouldn't be straight up. It's perpendicular to the surface, not the object. So that's the first scenario. The second scenario is when something is pulling up like examples that we saw with the plane pool, they were pulling at an angle, or if you're pushing down. And this is the oldest 
prank trick, whatever you want to call it. But imagine you have a friend who wants to step on a scale and see their weight and you go behind them and you push down from behind on the scale, hoping that they don't notice. And what you're doing is you're pushing down at an angle. The surface is still flat. The scale is still flat. But by pushing down, you're making the FN seem heavier. So that's an example of when FN will be different than uh, FG. All right, so here's an important slide. Uh, again, there's no units for the mu, the coefficient of friction. And remember that it's always between zero and one. The value is specific to a surface. There's absolutely no need for you guys to memorize anything. Um, you're either going to be given to you in the problem or you're going to be solving for it. Just make sure that when you do solve for it, it's a decimal between zero and one. Uh, if you got anything greater than that or if you got a negative number, then you did something wrong. You're going to see mu s, which is the static and the coefficient of static friction. And that's the one that you need for starting. You're also going to see mu k, which is the coefficient of kinetic friction. That's the friction that you need in order to keep moving. Just like how we mentioned earlier, force friction static was always greater than force friction kinetic. As likewise, the coefficient of friction for static, static coefficient of friction mu s, is always greater than mu k. So uh, co static coefficient of friction is greater than the kinetic co uh, coefficient of friction. If you're talking about the values between 0 and 1, there's not a whole lot of range, but obviously there's differences between the two. So if your answer has a, or if your surface has a larger value closer to one, it has more friction. If it has a smaller value closer to zero, it has lower friction. So the smoother the surface, the less resistance. And sometimes we want to have less resistance, you know, for different reasons. Uh, think about the bowling lanes, skating rinks, um, air hockey's, or just hockey field in general and pool table. These are all things in which you want to have the least amount of friction in order to obtain speed and keep speed and be able to do activities. All right, so let's go back to our phone activity. Uh, remember when we removed the case, you basically changed the coefficient of friction. So the table, the surface didn't change, but the surface of your phone did. It went from the case to the actual phone. So you changed the mu, the coefficient of friction. The case has a higher mu, the and which makes it less prone to slipping and sliding. That's why you purchase it. And if you want to be technical about it, we also lowered the FN because the phone is lighter without the case. So the mass of the phone plus mass of the case combined is two masses combined to make one mass. And that's greater than the phone by itself. So I'm sure when you first time took it off the case, you noticed the, how lighter it was, even though you've always had that phone for such a long time, possibly. All right, so let's take a little commercial break and let's see, you may have seen these objects at home or around, and now you can understand the physics behind it. Uh, so this presentation is not brought to you by these, but I'm giving a free advertisement. How do you move a sofa all by yourself? Very slowly. And that china cabinet across your hardwood floor? Very carefully. And how about that 200 pound washer? Well, you'll be amazed at what you can move with Easy Sliders, the sliding discs that everyone's talking about. Available at Bed Bath & Beyond. Take that sofa, for example. Just slip an Easy Slider under each leg and you're sliding it over carpeting with ease. They also come with soft fabric pads that simply slip on to protect your beautiful, expensive hardwood floors as you easily slide furniture along able to help you move up to 750 pounds imagine all that you can do with easy sliders best of all easy sliders work on hardwood floors carpet vinyl cement ceramic tile and more ready to take on that washing machine it's a cinch with easy sliders they're great for moving bulky appliances easily from your washer and dryer to your range refrigerator and more in fact move up to four items of health and more ready to take on that washing machine all right it's a cinch. look at her holding with it up with sliders. one hand i don't think They're she needs a slider so she's always easily. got plenty of strength from your washer and dryer 
refrigerator, and more. In fact, move up to four items at once. Even rearrange a room with easy slider multi-packs in the handy reusable container. Got a really big item to move? So yeah, so you may have seen this before. Um, but now you understand the science behind it or the physics behind it. Okay, this is important, so make sure you write this down. Uh, sometimes you're going to get some questions on this in a quiz or a test, and they might say, what does force of friction depend on? And they're going to give you different things. All you need to look at is you don't even need to memorize this. You just need to look at the equation and understand what's in the equation. It says that force of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction times F normal. So it depends on two things, the coefficient of friction, that mu, and the normal force, the Fn, which is your weight. Uh, just remember the exceptions. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to write this down. So yeah, you don't actually have to memorize this. Um, if you come across a question, just locate equation eight, you'll see the two things, and that's it. Force of friction depends on two things, the coefficient of friction and the weight of the object, which is F normal for us. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and start doing our sample problems. Uh, this problem is broken into a couple sections. The first one lays it out for us. Uh, the scenario, then the next two sentences are the actual questions. It says you push on a 60 kg cart with a force of 200 newtons. If coefic static coefficient of friction is 0 0.08 and the kinetic coefficient of friction is 0 0.05, how much force does it take to get the car moving? And the second question is, once you do get it moving, how much force does it take to keep it moving at a constant velocity? So let's just take it one step at a time and draw out our FBD. We have our object with a mass of 60 kg. We put that inside because mass is the amount of stuff that is an object has. Uh, there's the surface line. We have Fg, we have Fn. Our force applied, you pushed on it, was 200 newtons. That was the only thing that was uh, provided to us by the problem, the mass and the force applied. We know there's gonna be force friction, but we're just gonna leave it as FF for now because we have to decide which one are we using for this diagram. So, uh, in order to find Fg, remember that it's equation number nine, it says weight is equal to mass times gravity. The mass was 60 times the gravity of negative 9.8 meters per second squared, and our Fg is negative 588 newtons. Now, Fg is equal to Fn because this object is balanced vertically. The vertical for net force is balanced and is zero, so it is not experiencing acceleration in the vertical direction. So Fn is equal to 588 newtons. Again, remember, Fn is the weight or the exerted support force on the object. Now, the actual problem said, the first thing that said was, you know, how much force does it take to get the car moving? So which means it's at rest and we need to overcome that and get moving. So now we decide which friction we need to use and which value. And it's fr frictional force or static frictional force, so F of S, because you want to get it started or set in motion. So we're going to go ahead and label our vector to the left with FFS, static force of friction. And if you're solving for uh, static force of friction, you're going to use co static coefficient of friction, the mu S, the 0 0.08 value. So. It's still the same equation, equation 8. We're just going to label it as FFFS, or static force of friction, is equal to the coefficient of static friction times our F normal. We're going to go ahead and substitute our values, 0 0.08 for mu S and 588 for our Fn. Multiply those two, and you get 47.04 newtons. Now, it's frictional. It's to the left. Anything to the left and down is negative. So our picture looks like this, our FBD. It's frictional force, that static frictional force is negative 47.04 newtons. 
and the object has an applied force of 200 newtons. So clearly we applied more force than it was needed to overcome that. And this object is not only moving, but it's also accelerating to the right. So that's our answer for the first question. The amount of force needed to get the car moving was realistically only 47.04 newtons. That's all you need to get it moving. But we applied an excess amount and we did a total of 200 newtons. So let's move on to the second problem or the second portion of this. So there's the explanation for it. <clears throat> All right, now it says once you get it moving, how much force does it take to keep it moving? So we're gonna go ahead and look at our picture again and we are going to see what we need to do. So now it's keep it moving. So we're gonna go ahead and label it as F of F K. Some of you may have thought that, hey, it's constant velocity. All I need is 200 to balance it out. And it's not that simple, right? Uh, we've told you that in order to have balance out, net, balance net force, they need to be equal to each other. But that's some of the questions asking. The question is asking, once you got it moving, how much force does it really take to keep it moving at constant velocity? It's kind of like that plane pull example. Um, you're not gonna be able to continue to apply 200 newtons and probably you're applying too much. So realistically, how much do you need to apply to keep it going at constant velocity? So you can't just magically um, increase the vector size or the magnitude numerical value and be like, that's my answer. So we're actually gonna go ahead and solve for it. So again, it's moving, so it's force friction kinetic. And we are going to go ahead and solve with this. And since we're using for kinetic friction, we're going to use a coefficient, kinetic coefficient of friction. So it says solve for FFK, then you're going to use the kinetic coefficient of friction or mu K. And now the only difference between this and the previous problem is uh, coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.05 as opposed to the 0 0.08. So we take that 0 0.05, multiply it, by 588 newtons, which was our weight or our Fn, and we get the kinetic force friction as negative 29.4 newtons. So um, like I've said before, F of Fk, kinetic force friction, is always less than the static force friction, or static force friction is always greater than kinetic force friction. And once something is moving, you no longer need to apply as much force in order to keep it moving. So just like how mu s or coefficient of static friction is greater than coefficient of kinetic friction, kinetic friction force is uh, less than the static frictional force. All right, there is a problem with this FBD though. The question said, keep it at constant velocity. Right now as it is, this FBD is balanced vertically, net force is zero vertically. However, net force on this object horizontally is not balanced and it is experiencing a net force towards the right this at this the way it's drawn the object is accelerating to the right we want it to be depicted as if it's accelerated uh or i'm sorry just moving at constant velocity to the right so this fbd depicts an acceleration to the right so what we have to do is change our diagram and now it looks like this notice the change in the fa vector to force applied it is much shorter it matches the one on the left and the values also match so kinetic force friction is negative 29.4 newtons, and the applied force is the 29.4 newtons that we only need to apply in order to keep this object moving at a constant velocity. Just notice the subtle changes, be aware to make changes to those and um, adjust accordingly. Our FG and FN remain the same. And the only thing that we changed here was the applied force because we needed to match our kinetic friction and keep it at constant velocity. Okay, so this is the final slide, but this is also important, so pay attention. Um, this is how to solve for some different things. Now, for my students, I've always told you that, you know, just because you learn a brand new equation doesn't mean that's the equation you're gonna start using all the time. So if a question says, find a frictional force, you know, you're not going to just jump into automatically equation eight. It may be equation eight. It may not be. 
So you may have to use either the net force equations from FPD diagrams like you've done previously on quizzes and tests up to this point, or you may have to use equation eight. It really depends on what you have. So if you don't have the coefficient of friction and there's no way for you to solve for it, then there's no way you can get force friction. But if you do have, let's say, normal force and um, the coefficient of friction, you obviously use equation eight. So again, it just depends on the variables that you have. So just because you've learned equation eight today doesn't mean you will use equation eight all the time to find force friction. It's just another tool. To find a coefficient of friction, uh, there's only one way. It's frictional force divided by a normal force. Now you may have to find normal force first, which we've done previously. And to find normal force, you now have two options. You can go ahead and find it by using equation eight and manipulating it, frictional force divided by the uh, coefficient of friction will give you a normal force. Or don't forget how you've done it previously up to this point, which was Fg is equal to mass times gravity, which was equation nine. So there might be a simple way for you to find normal force. Sometimes you may have to go a little bit longer. It just really depends on what you have. Anyways, that is all we have for today. I hope that this uh, lesson was great and that it was helpful. So you guys have a wonderful day. Take care.